The series between No Tomorrow and Team Octalysis is closer than maybe we would have imagined as we sit 1-1 with No Tomorrow winning game one, but Team Octalysis proving that maybe it was just a blip. Maybe it was just a, a small amount of a problem for them uh, going into game three as they were able to take game two. Well, Gold Dan, yeah, he puts out a little bit of damage, and so I think that it wasn't enough in game number two. So we'll see if they continue that trend going forward. The Gul'dan paid out for him. Tomb of the Spider Queen, I think a different environment than Volskaya. Gul'dan does bring a lot of sustain, but I think that it was just too much to overcome there. And it was really well countered. The Thrall pick, the triple melee, we've seen it twice now from Octalysis, and they seem to be comfortable with that on any battleground. Just wonder if that's going to be a trend in all of their games. Well, the next game's going to be on Towers of Doom. So as always, we'll find out soon. Towers of Doom chosen by Team Octalysis means that no tomorrow after losing the last game has chosen first pick. And for them, we've seen an Alex Straza first pick, we've seen a Rainer first pick. I think they want to be in the first pick position so that they can get Rainer if Octalysis won't ban it. One thing I'm curious about, and it's something that we've only seen a couple of bans against Octalysis so far, but something that showed itself early in this phase is an old favorite on Towers of Doom of Zeratul. If you want to continue that triple melee, Maybe we get a Zeratul that could potentially come out in this draft. Have they gotten a win with that? I know they didn't win on Dragon. No, 0 and 1. It's been banned out, I think, twice against them it since has. that game. So 0 and 1 so far, but something to always consider in the later end of this draft with some of the changes that we've seen towards the Assassins with so many bans. We've seen some squishier targets, mm -hmm. and this is no tomorrow. It likes Dahaka, paired with a Falstad to have that double global. So Zeratul, it, Falstad is a Zeratul's best friend because you do not get away from a Zeratul with the Vorpal, the any, just any number of mobility options that Zeratul has. That's a situation of not reciprocated best friendship. Ooh. Zeratul what? loves Falstad. Falstad, Falstad doesn't love Zeratul. does not love Zeratul. He huh. does not want to be best friends with him. He would much Every be time I play Zeratul, like me and Falstad, we're like paired together. Falstad or Zeratul is like my second most played hero. I'm always on, like we hang out all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, I, I, I didn't really it didn't you. like it. I hate to break it to you. Huh. Not reciprocate him. Uh, oh. Abathur, of course, is going to be banned on Towers of Doom because he's almost always banned in in on Towers of Doom. My questions are around Dahaka, Rainer, and ranged assassins in general because that does seem to be the consensus of bans. For the most part, in this series, it's all about taking away some of the high damage dealing ranged assassins. Uh, I think it's very likely no tomorrow bans Tracer here. I would not want to give Dre to Tracer. And then also Genji. The Tracer was exactly what I was thinking. Is Octalysis willing to first pick Genji after their results last game? Genji actually made his way down in the draft. I think this map is okay to higher pick a Genji than it is some of the other battlegrounds that we have. A little bit more sustain oriented. So Diablo is going to be the name of the game after what we saw from Jin in game number one. It's definitely warranted a lot of respect from Octalysis. No, tomorrow does indeed p first pick the Genji. It was picked later on in the draft. This should give them, not only because they're in a first pick position this time, likely someone who can pair better with the Genji too. It's a different battleground, which is gonna be uh, already nice for a Genji because you can do a lot with the rotations of a Genji. Like try to get picks on the top laner. Ooh. Octalysis will keep with Buds as Alex Straza and get Goku's Ural. Ural, so much control. The threat of double global, once Genji shows up, not so much there. So Ural versus Tahaka or Blaze tends to play neutral. I was going to say went out in favor of Ural, but you don't actually win. You don't actually lose as Ural. You just make sure the other guy doesn't win, and it makes it really easy. And later on, dive into yeah. your team, your opponents and pretty much never die. This is a good, see, this is such a good combo. You now have Hanzo, who's going to be able to pick up Sapper Camps for the team. Uh, he can stay in that mid bot. Genji can join him later on. They have a possibility of the Dragon's Arrow into Dragon Blade, or we could see an X Strike if they want to play it a safer style. But either way, this looks a, a nice three picks for No Tomorrow. 
Johanna banned out, which means Muradin is likely, and if no tomorrow wants to ban that here, we will see what Octalis' next hero would be. ETC, potentially. Stitches has been another, but also Garrosh and Anubrak. If they really want to go dive heavy, Anubrak fits that. It's something they've played before. Garrosh is going to be there. You can cocoon the Genji, although we've seen a fair amount of X-Strike. Blaze. Taking away a potential Urel Blaze mm -hmm. composition. It was mm. Justin, I believe, that ran Urel. They ran a Urel Blaze comp before. No, I think you're thinking of Simplicity. Same team, but different. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Totally. So you're right, yes. Yes. Glad we're on the same page. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Justin has his Muradin. The, the Blaze is a strange band to see, but if you're all about damage and getting the burst and you want to get kills, then taking away the bunker is a good way to do that. And there you go, nice call. We've seen No Tomorrow pull off a similar composition of the Anubarak dive in. Maybe that was LFM I'm thinking about. Anubarak into the Malfurion roots. It can work. You get the single target. Hanzo does keep the Zeratul a little bit more at bay. I think it's still an option here, though. What I can say is this is a ridiculous, 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 uh, squishy <laughs> composition. I put those words together, and I'm going to stick with it. Ridicu squish composition. Malthiel, Anubarak, <laughs> Hanzo, and Genji. I almost feel like at this point we're going to see Twilight Dream, and it's just going to be like either we wipe you or you wipe us, and that's the end. Well, Li Ming picked up case right. of potential cocoon with Disintegrate, and we've seen some pretty outstanding <laughs> Prismat Li Ming play, because, I mean, what you said I thought was going a different direction, but we saw a lot of Phoenix damage from Prismat in the last game. Mm. We talked about the flexibility between Draded and Prismat, so I expect Draded to be back onto the Phoenix with Prismat on the Li Ming, but still up in the air. I think you're cheating and looking at the screen over I there. I didn't see it. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll find out. You're really laughing at my inability to speak <laughs> words. I mean, <laughs> what in Harry Potter, ridiculous. Oh, not, yeah. It's not always perfect English. Mm -hmm. That's a very good spell in case you guys need to make sure and you get rid of a Boggart. But Octalis is trying to get rid of a No Tomorrow. They're going to win here versus the all-in composition that No Tomorrow has for team fights. Let's see if they do it. Would a Boggart be Gazlo in this case? Because remember when they it's first whatever. came out and it was like the weird clown thingy? With well, no, it it, it, it takes the shape of whatever yeah, is scariest Yeah, but the very, one of the very first things that came out was that giant clown. Well, are you terrified of the giant clown skin uh, Gazlo? Okay, then what would the Bonger be? For Haloran, it would be Ginger Dread oh Nazebo. Oh, my God. Please don't tweet him at that, at underscore Haloran, <laughs> H-A-L-O-R-I-N. Doesn't he have an underscore? Uh, yeah, underscore H-A-L-O-R-I-N. Do not send him gingerbread and <laughs> ones. What would be your bogger if it was a hero? If it if it was a hero? Uh, Monkey Brightwing. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. Oh. Nice and pale there. That was nice. The, the jump onto Goku. So No Tomorrow is pretty all in with this Anubarak. We saw the pitfalls of Anubarak yesterday. Once you're in for fights, you are in, especially if you use Burrow Charge, which you often do because you want to get that chain crowd control and you have the Malfurion roots to follow up. But it's going to be hard if they don't take down somebody like a Urel, like a Muradin, um, or trying to dive into the back line, perhaps past them, should they want to jump in. Maybe that's the target and they just dive in and try to get a kill on uh, Li Ming. I think Buds is for sure going to be a cocoon target so that Life Binder can't get the save because that heal comes out so fast even before the big heal. This yeah. is URL counter. We've and been it's wondering. Gonna, it's only going to get worse We've in a few levels. Mm -hmm. Oh, Die Urel, alone. get some of this. Jhal's eyes 
turned to saucers as he realized who he needs to well, play hold on, next let's, week. Let's be real here. They went from small saucers to big saucers because they're already natural saucers. Uh, you said it, not me, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Strasso, more of that Q build focus that we've seen as of late. Another counter, similarly to what we saw from Deckard, is the touch of death from Malthale. Mm -hmm. So you can put down a little bit of shade action going over one of those green circles and hit that level seven activatable to reduce some of the healing. Goku is gonna be Body block, but I don't think this is where Jin wants to be. Definitely not where he wants to be. First blood for Octalysis as they all speed off into the sunset. Well, or just the top lane. Once you go in, Gilly, as an Anubarak, it is so difficult to make it out. But the Goku setup and the body blocks from Team Octalysis, that's a little bit more difficult to pull off in an uncoordinated environment like we have here in HGZ. But it is definitely something to take note of that if an Anubrak wants to be aggressive, counter CC and body block him because he will not make it out. Unless at level 10 he went Locust Swarm, which is a little bit scary to stack on top of it. Maybe we will now that Li Ming is in the equation. But as we ramp up for the first altar activation phase, no dominance as that generally is the charged blast when we talk about prismaticism playing Li Ming. But this is Genji and Hanzo and Malthale. There's a lot of damage there. He's going to be relying on a lot on the healing of Alex Shaza potentially if Li Ming tends to be the target in team fights. Prisma coming in with a decent amount of damage. That's going to force the Burrow charge out. Justin and Drated both going in aggressively. There's going to be the stun locked down. Now we got the flank coming in. Hanzo is still showing in that bot lane, so they know they have numbers. Casanova, swift strike in. He's going to trade out with Drated, and Drated with no shield, forced to back away from that. Play things even. So in the long run, Hanzo getting that bot lane so definitely more advantageous. Now we've seen on a pale horse that Malthale can make rotations from top to mid. Should the rest of the team need to be in the bottom lane or working on the sappers? Yurel's about to be seven, so she'll have Divine Steed as a way of being able to keep up with that. It's a faster uh, mounted amount, but it does decay. Whereas on a Pale Horse, it's just permanently mounted. Slight differences there. Level seven arrives for Team Octalysis. We'll see if Goku wants to get the Divine Steed. We've seen a lot more Holy Avenger. There's the Divine Steed pickup for Octalysis. Pretty close game between No Tomorrow and Octalysis. You know, there's something about these mount talents lately. Lunara got a rework. She gets hippity hop. Rainer gets a rework. Giddy up. Giddy up. But we get Divine Steed, not as catchy as the other two. No, but that's a. Isn't that a, wow. a thing? It's the like wow. An actual thing. There's a whole bunch of things. Yeah, yeah, but this is the Nexus where we get to change the rules. That's true. So it makes our game so good. It's a good point. All right, next altar phase starting up will be the safe altars in both the lanes. So probably going to see a trade here. There is a slight lead for Team Octalysis, but only barely there with a four shot advantage. Both teams just playing it safely, playing it out, get it, getting whatever is on their side of the halfway mark, except for the uh, earlier pickup of the top sappers and the Ooh. couple of kills, which about happened for No Tomorrow. Wow, Octalysis is Prismat. getting aggressive. Max range. Magic missiles coming out here from Prismat. Traded, he's going to wait for his shield to come back up. Justin's still looking to stack. It's going to miss out there, but we got Shrite coming on. Like, nice scatter arrow. Goku in deep. He's in trouble. There's Swift Strike. That should get the reset. It does. And now Drated being traded out upon, but the Dragon Queen enough to keep him alive for now. Touch of Death coming in, reducing some of that healing. But Shrite has just been poking away on that back line. Octalysis has to retreat. Yeah, the, uh, that extension was punished despite having Dragon Queen and Octalysis feeling like they could fight that out. A lot of that was that Jen left, came back, got the stun lock on Yurel, and Yurel is Yurel, yes, but she doesn't have Ardent Defender yet, not till 10. And that was something that they could punish getting the kill as Goku was hoping to zone away so the Octalysis could get cheeky and get another steal there. 
So far, both teams, one kill apiece. That was sniffed out. Goku making it on point in time. Tomster with a little bit of sidestep, trying to go. He's in trouble, looking for reinforcements. He's alive for now, but not for long. And reinforcements did not make their way in here quick enough. So kill number two for Ontalysis, camp picked up. And that experience was pretty much even a moment ago and now firmly in favor of Octalysis. Stormbolt hits, Nature's Cure used. Justin takes some arrows to the face or the knee. Tin hit by Octalysis, still the life finder. You know, when you have a Malthale, and both of these teams have been willing to play Malthale, it's often that you'll see him rotating around trying to get camps by himself. And so it did feel like that's something that No Tomorrow should have known that Octalysis may have collapsed on it, especially with how aggressively Octalysis is playing this particular game, being willing to invade an enemy altar that early in the game, that's not usual. You don't generally see that. So Octalysis is trying to play this as aggressively as possible. You, you haven't played many first-person shooters, right? I played a lot of Halo. Okay, but did you play any Overwatch? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, why? Do you shoot people in the knee? With <laughs> arrows? Yeah. <laughs> you know that saying, right? I was gonna be World Class X until I took an arrow to the knee. No. Wow, this is, guys, this is a first. It's the first time I know a meme that Jay Howe hasn't. I just need to revel in this for a little bit. So can you please continue commentating, Jay Howe? I'm just, I'm just of the belief that this moment. it's Overwatch and you're, so much. You're, you're playing Hanzo and you're shooting him in the knee. And it's Justin and Goku trying to separate Tomster, but he's got the dash, the jump back over. Root's going to miss there. Goku making use of the Divine Steed. He's going to walk away for the moment. Now Octalysis looking to control a little bit, distance their lead, Cocoon out. Jen and team looking to take the fight. Dragon Queen out in return. X-Strike coming down. Prismat somehow survives. Life Binder is enough. And now Jen somehow walking away. Hammer not enough, but Malthale did fall. Oh, that Life Binder did not make for happy times Ooh. for a last rites. Li Ming was extremely low. The focus was there after she went in to use Disintegrate to take out the cocoon on Yorel. And then having the life binder to get the first heal and then the heal up. Last rites takes a little bit of time to go off. And so in that amount of time, being able to get the heals there, spotted that out. And that made all the difference in the world. Getting that one kill, you just can't deal with resets when you're that low. So unfortunately for No Tomorrow, they have to give up another altar, which sets them back even further in the core. I really thought Casanova was so close to just popping off in that fight. X-Strike just wasn't enough. So now Octalysis with a an eight core health lead. And I think more importantly at this point is the experience advantage in Prismat, not willing to step anywhere outside of this gate except to pick up a globe. He's just going to chill. I don't think they can afford to step through here. Even looking at the minimap, the pathing of Octalysis, they are taking a very safe route around this map. Tomster was also being safe, did not try to get the camp all by himself since he was punished for that last time, the, or the last rotation of the sappers. And tomorrow, just going to work on getting their sappers, their safe ones, and Octalysis is posturing around that center area. It coming up in Ooh. a mere 10 seconds. Goku goes in. Just short of landing on that point. So unable to contest with that 13. So I'll have to clean those up in a moment. Double altar phase coming up here and see if we get the trade or whether Octalysis is going to try and keep up the momentum. See if they can force their hand against No Tomorrow. That timing of Octalysis being able to make sure that they have sappers here, it is going to push just over the line in this bottom lane. So Octalysis wants to clear those out quickly because this then will favor them in having the clear of the lane, the better setup to go between those two altars. Alex draws is starting the channel. This is seen by No Tomorrow. Goku, Goku comes gets the in stall the big from hammer. The, up in the top. He's like, hey, uh, I'm here. That was enough. Now Octalysis can regroup together and fight over this next one as Goku dives right back in on top of Tomster. Oh, Jin's going in, Swiss Strike follow-up. There's going to be the Dragon Arrow, but the Dragon in return as Life Finder is there. Buds, Last Rites is on him, but the heal. Buds is a god on this Dragon of Alex Straza. And they go all in. Buds says nada. They stay alive. Buds proves me wrong. Casanova. Wow, Casanova is a god. Woo. 
Prismaticism staunches that, stomping down, taking out Genji. Here's the big difference between Ancestral and Lifebinder. Lifebinder can work either way. So if Alex Straza starts to fall over, she takes the health and gets the healing back from that. And Team Octalysis, they do lose Alex Straza in the end, but getting enough kills to keep the channel going, 32 to 16, double. The core health is a very safe place to be in for Octalysis in this game three. It's really amazing. It kind of makes me wonder, has Alex Straza kind of always been kind of good, or is Lifebinder just really OP right now? Well, before you still got that giant burst heal, but the yeah. problem was trying to live long enough for it to go off. Now you have the heal in the middle of that, so it's a big deal that it hit. But I had a friend who was playing it before, felt like it was still viable, though we didn't see it. It's definitely viable here. Trader's gonna warp away, so he doesn't even take damage from the last rites either. Purification Salva Tranquility is gonna do its best to keep people healed through that, and it does enough that Casanova can start to get in the back. X-Strike drops down, and he's doing work. Casanova is causing so much chaos in the back line of Octalysis. Jen has been initiating, but it's been the follow-up Casanova, and then beyond the follow-up, more follow-up to his own follow-up. It's putting out the damage, but it is not netting the results. And I really wonder if this is anybody other than Alex Straza. What does this game look like for No Tomorrow? Because they have been all in in these kills and so close every time. Well, Jay Howe, it's a major problem now that the fifth altar activation is about to begin because Octalis is willing to give up their sappers because they are so close to 16. Should give them, at the very least, a double altar phase. That's eight more shots on the core. Nobody has been able to touch bell towers. This has been entirely two team fighting teams. And then occasionally grabbing a sapper camp here and there, Prismat. Well, that damage. Throws a, a full combo onto a new barrack. Trade on the channels in the top. Both of the solo laners starting to come down, but No Tomorrow's gonna leave Mouthale in the mid to hopefully soak them up, but they're still a ways away from being able to get 16. It's a difficult challenge they face without 16, but they have poke opportunities, but Octalysis, they're forcing it just a bit. Walk away, does No Tomorrow. And that's Octalysis. Able to get an even stronger lead here as they're up 28 to 8. So Boss is up, which would give another four shots. But Octalysis are going to use that 16 in the very limited window that's left just to get whatever's close to them. That looks like the Sapper Camp of No Tomorrow because that Bell Tower in the bottom lane has sustained some damage. Oh, Dragon now we're talking. Zero. Now we're talking. X Strike gets one, gets two. That's enough. Murden's going to come out of this. Should have the Thunderclap. That goes down. That's going to get the healing static value. Avatar there. Dwarf toss enough to get over the wall. Goku going to buy a little bit of space. I think the thing to remember about No Tomorrow more than anything after casting them for the past four weeks is they still are figuring a lot of things out, but they are figuring them out. And one of the things that they still do very well is punish you if you overextend even a, the tiniest amount, right? It's happened multiple times even in this series. It's happened that have let them be able to take, I think they had one game earlier on. They still can identify, yeah, versus Endemic on the boss on Sky. They can identify those moments. It's more about creating moments and more moments that they can get the punishment there. Problem is they're losing their mouth ale right now. And right as an altar's about to spawn, they have bottom, which does take off some of the pressure from their bottom lane, but they also have to be concerned about the boss. Prismat, I'm pretty sure he doesn't make it out of here. Dragoner, I don't even think needed. Wait a second. Surprise! Buds comes down in the nick of time. Pass Look at this. Goes down to Casanova. Now we've got the Pencher Assault here. Yeah, Yurel and Murden, but the damage is so far away from this. Can they keep him here is the question. Ice Block undoubtedly should do that. Jin's trying to cut off the joining up of this team, and this fight is happening on multiple fronts. Buds gets out of the cocoon, though, and with a salvo, Jin will fall. The first kill there. Akaface wants to retreat to the safety of this forward camp of the Bell Tower there. Man, Casanova is trying and doing everything in his power to try to trade kills out for his team. It is admirable. 
They need to finish this bell tower before they channel if they want to use the boss for an end, which seems inevitable at this point for Octalis. Is that they now have a 28 to 4 health lead, and that's exactly where they're going. Malthiel and Hanzo will be all that stands between them. Anubrak still 10 seconds away before he comes in. Dragon's arrow is here. Scatter arrow on the point. But if there is no way for you to survive, this might be all she wrote. Right now, Dragon Arrow hits on to four. They're holding for now. Nubrak making his way over, but Shrite in all sorts of trouble. I think this is a great example of showing what I meant when I said that Octalysis macros to team fight. They feel good when they're fighting. And yes, they could have gone up. Yes, they could have started the boss. But instead, what if they just force more staggered deaths? They get further into the faces of No Tomorrow and then try to finish off the game with the bottom camp control. That bottom lane, that bottom bell tower is pretty low, but now no tomorrow's back up except for Hanzo. And they have to keep grouping over that boss because it is a win condition for Octalysis, which just allows Octalysis to gain so much control over this bottom lane. And now they have 20, <laughs> so they don't have to worry as much about giving the fight to no tomorrow that no tomorrow would want. Oh, you can't let that through. You can't let that through. Okay. There were four sappers because mm -hmm. there's three coming in behind this. So three sappers can't end. There's always a possibility for something crazy on Towers of Doom. Comebacks are very much real. No tomorrow. On their last leg here in this, sappers interrupted. Dragon Arrow's gonna hit. Life Finder's out. That's enough, Li Ming. They overstay their welcome. Salvo in response. Akafe is able to keep alive for now. Casanova. Casanova. Forces the shield, but it's there to keep Draden safe. There's an altar still that Team Octalysis could fight over, but without Li Ming, that's a lot of their damage gone. No tomorrow. Steps forward. They don't have the bot bell tower as a point of retreat. Buds is gonna get into the Dragon Queen. Jin dives in there. Casanova joins. Alex Straza deleted. Nubrak's gonna fall in return. Justin still trying to hold on point, but that scatter arrow was monstrous to take down a large part of that health bar. Ardent Defender is there. Phoenix falls. Gilly Octalysis is falling apart right now. Moving forward with those sappers nets you what? Probably not a lot. It's hard versus Malfurion because the roots. It's just everything, the impale and everything in that choke point. The dragon arrow set it up. The perfect follow-up that's been there throughout the entire game. Last rites, Justin falls, staggered death after staggered death. Octalysis goes from what should be giving away something, fighting 20 versus 18 over an altar to losing one death, then fighting 4v5 and continuing to poke and prod their way to staggered deaths. This is turning into just a catastrophic mistake after mistake and it's still very much in their favor. That's yeah, the crazy the, thing. The only thing that's saving them is they had such a massive lead in this game. But now No Tomorrow has 20. They have no one can stop death. They have rewind for a new Barak. By the way, those roots were amazing to stop Justin from being able to escape there. There's still uh, three seconds until Ural's back in play and 20 more until Murinin, which still gives No Tomorrow plenty of time to rotate back around to take back Bot. The thing is that top, that top is still an issue for No Tomorrow. And really, it's not too much because any altar for Octalysis is going to give them the four shots unless No Tomorrow can get this bot, which is why we see them trying to get both of these Sapper Camps so they can take this bot bell tower back, if possible, with the double uh, Sapper Camp so that one altar does not allow Octalysis to finish off this game. Goku holding point. See if he becomes a priority target. Self cleanse is there. Healing goes down. They hold off a lot of that damage. Ooh, this is going to be hard, J. Hal. For Octalysis, they just need one. For No Tomorrow, they need both and a lot more. If they can win another decisive they team fight, die. that'd be a start. There's going to be stun after stun. Casanova's swift strike out, unable to swift strike in for now. But Anubarak just gets wiped off the face of this map. That is one death. Tomster surviving for now. No Tomorrow left because they needed all five. And all Octalysis has to do is push back enough of No Tomorrow. And with those few kills, Malthiel running back in. But that is 
they've sent Dreaded back already. Octalysis get the win, but it was questionable for several minutes. Things got very hairy in that mid to late game. You're cool, you're calm, you're winning, you're up like 20, you've been dominating the whole game. And then Li Ming dies, there's like one bead of sweat. You take a fight and you're like, oh, this is not going well. And then there's like more beads of sweat coming down. It's scary, but ended up paying off in the long run. Phoenix continuing to be at the top of the meters here for Octalysis. Shrite did an admiral job on that Hanzo. The dragon arrows that he landed towards the end of the game and post 10 were pretty impactful. Just wasn't enough in some of these team fights and life binder, just too much to overcome for those blow up targets. Yeah, I feel like no tomorrow, everybody did a very good job. The problem was life binder and the Li Ming pick to stop Cocoon because the cocoons that we saw for the most part were cleared out so fast they disintegrated. that they really couldn't get too much done with it. Just disintegrated mm -hmm. yeah, instantly. It's like made of B tier silk, just melts, I just rips I mean, apart. I guess that's what B tier silk does. It melts. Mm -hmm. Gonna probably research that later, mm -hmm. you know, or not. But either way, Octalysis <laughs> finds themselves up two one. Yep. Uh, they they had a very controlled style on Volskaya. Worked out well for them. Almost had a very controlled game in Towers of Doom. Maybe let a little bit slip away, but make no mistake about it. Very, very strong performances in game two and three. For No Tomorrow, the dive potential, if that's anybody other than Alex Straza, there are more kills to be had, and that game looks entirely different. But Bud's managed to timely, every single time, use that life binder, and even in that one instance, it works both ways, and it worked out very, very well for Octalysis in this game. Now that we've seen the high priority on Alex Straza multiple times, triple ban phase, is it time to... Ben, Alex Straza in the first part of our games? We'll find out likely in the next game while we wait for the next map between these two teams. Talking about Octalysis and what they need to do here. They absolutely need a win over No Tomorrow. They cannot lose this series because they lost to Endemic because they're sitting at two and three. Getting that win would tie them back up with Endemic. But Endemic still have the better game differential. They've been able to close things out a bit cleaner for them. And so Team Octalysis you know, it's not it's not over for them. It's not guaranteed just by getting this win over No Tomorrow. They've got a lot more things to do. But for Endemic, their last match is versus Ooh. Tempo Storm next week. That's scary. Yeah, and Octalysis, is they're going to play Freedom. So this is very convoluted between those three teams and who gets those two spots. I think to further emphasize how important that is, that 10 and 10 record is before this series. And right now, Octalysis is 2 and 1, oh, okay. which puts them at 12 and 11. And if they win the next one, they're tied 13 and 11. Then, so it's first your win-loss record in your match record, then it's the plus minus. Yes. Then it's the head-to-head. -head. And, and since they would both head -head? be 13 and 11, right. that head-to-head -head is there. So Octalysis has to face Team Freedom. No easy matchup for them. Endemic, no easy matchup for them against Tempo Storm. For Octalysis, they cannot afford another loss here because you have no idea how that will go against Team Freedom. Endemic, the underdogs right now against Tempo Storm. We don't know how that will go. So if both teams lose those series, it could be as simple as one loss in a series that could be the determining factor. So Octalysis, they need another win here without another loss yeah, to further their odds. They have to stop dropping games. They cannot afford to drop another game to no tomorrow. They really couldn't afford that first one. Here's how we go through tiebreakers when you look at who gets to claim spots and even seeding within the teams and where they end up at the end of the part in the standings. Looking at match record and then game record and then head to head. Further on down, there's a lot of different ways. Finally, there is a tiebreaker match that could be possible. We have had one of those in the history of HGC and it was in Korea, I believe right before the mid-season brawl. No, right before BlizzCon in the HGC Grand Finals or finals, but uh, it's it's very unlikely that you get to the tiebreaker match because there's so many different things that we look at. It's a lot of action here in North America. Also in Europe, there's still a lot to be determined in that, in that three, four, five spots. Mm -hmm. So a lot of a lot to look forward to. We'll keep our focus here, Octalysis. For them, they need this win. No more losses. They expected an easy series. Even Bud said it in the interview. Think it'll be an easy? And if you get 3-0, then you are ahead in the plus minus before you go into next week. Now, the best they can do is tie. So very important.
for them on this fourth map. Well, what we've seen from both of these teams is a whole lot of aggression. So what better battleground to go to than Battlefield of 